Speak these words in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So I want to begin this morning asking a few questions. When was the last time you experienced change? Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Maybe it was a major life decision, perhaps a new job or moving somewhere else. Or maybe it was bringing home a bundle of joy or bundles of joy from the hospital. What did it feel like the last time you experienced change? Or how about this question? What did it feel like the last time you were in the midst of a challenge or a difficult situation? What were your thoughts? What were your emotions? Well, what about this question? What did it feel like when you were stressed in a stressful situation? Or what did it feel like when, it, when you felt like you were suffering? I imagine we all would answer these questions differently. But when I look at my own life in the midst of challenges, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of struggles, in the midst of suffering, three themes emerge. Fear, confusion, and anxiety. Fear, confusion, and anxiety. If you look at today's epistle from Peter, Peter is writing to an early church, a church in its infancy, a church that has challenges and struggles and difficulties and is suffering, he says. And he addresses these three things. Fear, confusion, and anxiety. So today I want to look at what he says. Because I think Peter offers us an outlook, a Christian outlook, a Christian perspective, a Christian vision on how to approach the changes and the challenges in our lives. The first thing Peter says is fear. Do not fear. Do not fear what others fear. He probably knows something about Scripture and knows one of the most common phrases is what? Do not fear. Fear. We live in a culture of fear. Fear is societal. It spreads like wildfire. Fear. You come home from work. You turn on the television, you turn on your computer, breaking news, right? Suddenly you're scared of something you didn't know you were supposed to be scared of. Fear. Fear. Politicians on both sides of the aisle use fear. They know it's an effective tool, and I'm not stepping into the political can of worms this morning. Our email server can't handle the stress. So I'll use a nonpartisan example of fear. What happens on a December or January morning when you wake up and you find out that there is a 30% chance of snow that afternoon? We turn into a culture of fear. We cancel the schools. The streets get jammed because we're trying to go to the grocery store. And once we get to the grocery, we buy all the bread, the milk, and the eggs on this side of the Mississippi. Actually, in my house, Margaret Ann goes to the grocery and I go to the bottle shop. Because <laughs> if I'm going to be locked in a house for four or five days with those kids, I need, to, I need some medicine. <laughs> Fear. I remember moving to New Haven, Connecticut. I spent 25 years in Tennessee. I then moved for my first year of seminary to New Haven, Connecticut, and it was the first big snow of the year, right? And I skipped class. I think it was probably a class on First Peter. And I <laughs> head off to the grocery store because I'm so scared of the snow. And I buy all these groceries, more than, than, than is allotted for a seminary and budget. And I remember the cashier looking at me and saying, boy, you're having a party tonight. <laughs> I said, no, sir, I'm just bracing for the snow. 
He said, you're not from around here, are you? I said, I'm from Tennessee. He says, you have nothing to be afraid of. Fear. Peter says, do not fear what others fear. When life presents its changes and challenges, do not fear what others fear. The second thing Peter says is he addresses confusion. Do not be confused. Notice what he says. He says, take account of the hope that is in you. Take account of the hope that is in you. I love Peter. Peter is one of the great Christians. He gets so many things right, and then he gets so many things wrong, and often at the very same time. Remember, it's Peter who starts walking on water, then sinking. It's Peter who confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, then he denies the crucifixion, and Jesus has to tell him, get behind me, Satan. It's Peter that follows Jesus into Jerusalem, yet denies him three times. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is John 21. I grew up in a cradle Episcopalian like many kids here, but I had a conversion in my teenage years reading John 21. It's where the resurrected Jesus stands before Peter. Peter, who that morning must have gotten up and said, I've done so many things wrong. Peter, who that morning must have gotten up and said, I, I can't, be, can't be the one. Look at all the failures. I don't have it in me. And yet the resurrected Jesus stands before him in what must have been a powerful moment. And says, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my flock. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter experiences the resurrected Jesus stand before him and say, I still believe in you. I still love you. I still have hope in you. And so Peter can turn and he can tell the church, take account of the hope that is in you. Notice what Jesus says in today's Gospel, I am in you and you in me. And when life gets crazy, and when we don't know which way to turn, Peter's words are so important. Take account of the hope that is in you. The third and final point. Do not be anxious. Peter says, keep your conscience clear. Notice, he says, keep your conscience clear. Then he, further down, he says, appeal to God for a good conscience. We have anxious minds, don't we? And when things get stressful, our anxiety only multiplies. Strap a blood pressure cuff to my arm if you want to find out. We are anxious people. One of my favorite prayers in the liturgy is that opening prayer, that colic for purity that Thee prayed. And if you're one of those people that always come in 10 or 15 minutes late, this might be the first time you've ever heard it. <laughs> it's a great prayer. Take it home. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts and our minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse away that anxiety to focus on you. To focus on you. Our minds as Episcopalians are an important part of our faith. It's, what, it's an important part of what it means to be a Christian, to engage the mind, right? We have a three-legged stool, Scripture, tradition, and reason. We use our minds to engage Scripture, our minds to engage the history and the traditions of the church. 
in Anglican history, a lot of our founding, a lot of our great stuff comes from Oxford and Cambridge. Episcopal churches tend to found schools or have schools on their campus, and we are no exception. The mind is important. Engaging our mind is part of who we are. Former Harvard chaplain Peter Gomes says that our task, our project as Christians, is to raise people to have thinking hearts and loving minds. Hear that again, to have thinking hearts and loving minds. Our jobs as Christians in formation with our parishioners, with our students, is to raise them to have thinking hearts and loving minds. Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Focusing the mind on Christ. One of my favorite prayers in the Book of Common Prayer is on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Now let your mind water, wander a little to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Lots going on. I just started my Christmas shopping on the fourth Sunday of Advent. <laughs> You're trying to wrap gifts. Guess what? We have you come back here and bring your children for the Christmas pageant on the fourth Sunday of Advent for a little rehearsal. There's lots going on. Oh yes, my in-laws decided to come to town. The fourth Sunday of Advent is an anxious time in all of our lives. And so one of the great prayers, I truly believe one of the great prayers in our prayer book is that prayer on the fourth Sunday of Advent. You know how it goes? Purify our conscience. Purify our conscious, almighty God by your daily visitation. Beautiful. Purify our conscious, almighty God by your daily visitation. Help us declutter our mind and see you present, O oh God, here and now amidst the challenges and amidst the changes. Peter says, keep your conscience clear and appeal to God for a good conscience. So let me wrap things up and say we have come to an end of a programmatic year. We've had graduations. We've had Holy Eucharist instruction class. We've had confirmations. Next week begins Memorial Day weekend, parish retreat. Change is happening all around, and we go into summer, and there's more change, and we come back from summer, and there's even more change as we begin a programmatic year. And if you're sitting in these pews as an Episcopalian, you don't do change well. That's why you're here. <laughs> same pew, week in, week out, same thing. And so take Peter's words with you. Peter's words are so important. As you face challenges, as you face changes, as you face stress and suffering and difficulty, remember what he says. Do not fear. Do not fear what others fear. Do not be anxious. Take account of the hope that is in you, he says. And then finally, do not be anxious. Do not have that anxious mind. Do not have that anxious mind. Keep your conscience clear, he writes and appeal to God for a good conscience. Amen.